Yay! Okay. Welcome back to to parents read the darndest things. Yay! And uh, we read the darndest thing. We read about a serial killer. Cause yeah, this one is definitely parents only discussion. Um, it's really dark. So I don't think kids should be listening. <laughs> I didn't think about that, but older kids, yes. Yeah, I think it's interesting, you know, if you're like a teen, but I don't think like an eight year old should listen in on this one. Yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe some warnings to tune off uh if there's any kind of sensitivity towards um scary murder. stuff. Yeah, murder and uh gore, because it was pretty gnarly um yeah it's not i don't know talks wasn't super family friendly either so i thought like it wasn't like gory yeah true um this is there definitely things about talks that made me think about this though yeah. this is definitely um in the vein of more criminal minds than superman so do with that info what you will but uh do you want to Talk about, like, give a brief synopsis of it. Uh, American Predator is about the serial killer, Israel Keys. He was an arsonist, a rapist, and a murderer. Um, he's from Alaska. That's where he got caught. He, he is confirmed to have killed three people, but suspected at least eight more, um, given what was on the walls of his cell at the time of his death. Um, so I'm just going to say he killed about 11 people. It was from 96 to 2012. Of course, he wasn't caught until his last victim, Samantha Koenig, got away um, for with it for so long because he would crisscross the U.S. and he had these analog kill kits that we'll talk about. Yeah. Um, and I think those kill kits are really what helped him get away with it for so long. There's a lot of stuff out there about this guy. Um, which was really interesting. There's tons of articles, of course, but there's like at least two docu series, um, an interview with the author where she goes into detail about how she like compiled it. So she reviewed recordings, transcripts, documents, everything from the case to put together the book. So a lot of what we read was like verbatim from interviews, which I thought yeah. was really interesting, but it's still Spooky. kind of like a novel. I wasn't weighed down with information, so I liked it a lot. Um, and all those documentaries and articles and like Murderpedia and stuff, we can link in the Discord. Yeah. Um, it's a super quick read. It doesn't. Yes. I think I read it in like four or five hours. Like it's not. Yeah. It wasn't really hard. I laid down in bed to read it one night, and before I knew it, I was halfway through just because like each chapter is a cliffhanger. You know, I was like, no, I really want to know what happens next. And then when I got to like 50% on my Kindle, I was like, I have to go to sleep now. Yeah. It's yeah. And it's not, yeah, it's not overly weighed down with information. It's kind of like, here's what happened. Yeah. And it just keeps going. So, uh, yeah. Good. Yeah. I like that about it a lot because I really like nonfiction, but if all you do is give me like a string of facts, I don't retain any of it. And it's really boring. Yeah. But he like got all the facts and then used it to string a narrative. So I like it a lot. Definitely recommend it. 10 out of 10 for those who aren't scared of stuff. This is juicy. So where do you want to start? I think I want to start general at first. Um, something that really made me think was in the preface, she talks about like the global obsession with serial killers. Yeah, um, but they're actually only like 1% of murderers are serial killers. So it's like the rarest form of murder, which I did not know, because you think there's like criminal minds and mind hunter and books and movies and whatever that it's like a lot more prevalent, mm -hmm. but it's not. And so she's like, that's why people are so interested in it. It's not dark. You just want to know why this rare like phenomenon is happening. So I'd be really interested to see what people think about that. Like, do you think an obsession or an interest with like serial killers or dark true crime is like morbid 
or do you think it's just like an enigmatic fascination like that person is not like you and me and you can't understand why yeah I always kind of felt like it's confronting something you are afraid of yeah in much the same way that um doomsday preppers are taking on this crazy situation that's scary and taking action and like learning about it um, yeah I feel like, yeah, like serial killers are such an unknown, like there's such a why and it's so unrelatable that there's like a search for understanding. Um, Yeah. Like, like a lot of the things we do when we don't understand something, we like peer into it, even if it's scary. Um, Yeah, I agree. I think it's just like, it's a relaxed form of research and a science. Yeah. I'm really into true crime. I listen to like podcasts. I read a lot of these books. You know, I watch a lot of these documentaries on Netflix and stuff. So I don't think it's morbid. I think that it's really interesting. And even if you're like, I learned ways to protect myself just because I was constantly enraptured by this stuff. You know, maybe you wouldn't carry pepper spray or something like that if you aren't worried about serial killers. But like, even if there's no serial killer in your town you still took some measures to protect yourself and that's not a bad thing. So I think even though we're learning about all this dark stuff, it can still have a positive impact for yourself. Yeah. I mean, I think people and humans uh, were still kind of lizard brained in a lot of ways. Like we're still like self-preservation mode. So yes, you know, it's essentially we're little field mice and we're trying to learn about cats. Like we want to learn how to avoid it. We want to learn why they're so scary. We want to, it's that dark aspect, but it's also coming from a place of um, survival. Like we just want to know, we want to be prepared. Um, so even if it is rare, it's almost the rarer it is, the scarier it is. And the more we want to know about it. Like we won't, we don't want to know about the guy who got shot at the gas station. Like that's too common. Like we already know that's a threat. Yeah. But super scary rare ones, yeah, like we want to know. We're curious minded creatures. So yeah, maybe it is a little morbid, but I don't think I know too many people who refuse to delve into it either. Because yeah. curiosity wins out for sure. Yeah. I agree. I like that you said it's like lizard brain survival mode. Yeah. Yeah. I can get on board with that. Like it's your primal need to know. We gotta know. Yeah. yeah. If anybody wants to drop some discussion in the Discord or the YouTube comments or whatever, we would like to know what you think. Oh, yeah. And I also want to know if you're like one of those people who would never read this book, who are like serial killers, no thanks, I'll listen to a discussion, but I don't want to read it. Um, are you just like super mentally sound? Like, are you just good to go? Like, you're not worried about any of this? <laughs> You're just good because I want to know how like, to wake up every way. morning and eat your fluffy eggs and go for a walk in the sunshine and nothing scares you. Like you're just like, man, it won't happen to me. Like I want yeah. that confidence. So, you know, drop a comment telling me how you got there because I want to do yeah. that. So just let me know. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Anything you want to add before we move on? No. Um I think that's, I think that was a really good introduction to the topic and like why this is something that we would bring into a book club. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely something you can connect to real life, even if you don't think you want to. Okay. So another thing I wanted to talk about how the Anchorage Police Department was initially handling the the missing persons case. But I read that Anchorage houses 40% of Alaska's population. It is a big city, but the police department, at least at this time, acts as though they only have the skills and resources of like this really small rural town. Yeah. So I want to know what you think about how they handled it. I have some thoughts, but you go first. Um, the first thing I highlighted on page five was if the kiosk was in fact a crime scene, it had already been contaminated. (laughs) A girl goes missing. It's a crime scene. Like it doesn't matter. 
Um, and it was just from the start, I don't think intentionally dismissed, but definitely underestimated. Yes. And, it's, and it's times like this where in retrospect, you're like, you idiots, like why, how could you have missed it? But it also goes to show how unprepared we are and especially the Anchorage um, Police Department were for the possibility of real crime. Like, and I think that's pretty normal. I hate to defend them because it was such lousy police work, but my, I guess my first guess would be like serial killer. Like she was definitely serial killed, but I'm paranoid and I'm always on the lookout for danger. I guess if you're a policeman and you're working in it, your first guess would be like runaway. Um, yes, but that bothered me so much. <laughs> it did. And then I'm kind of like, I get it. I do. Like, I get it. I don't, because I have all the information and I know what the case is about. I'm like on the outside looking in and I'm like, do you not have seen this? If it were me, I don't know if I would have gone, she was taken and it was kidnapped or it was murder. I don't know. So um, now I'm like, they were a bunch of fools and this should have been handled better. However, going into the readings and more and more, especially in that initial um, investigation, there were so many, so many. And from the whole case, there were so many times when I was like, you almost blew this case. Like it was pure, yeah. it was pure luck. And that's um, incredible to me that this almost didn't get I mean, he, he almost got away with it. Yes, I... He almost got away with this. Honestly, I felt like it was sloppy. Super sloppy. I like that you're making efforts to <laughs> use kind words and defend them a little bit because I had no plans to do that. I was just like, if this girl is reported missing, you should treat it like she's missing, like yeah. a crime was committed. And they were so hung up on like, oh, she just ran away. She was 18, you know, whatever, wanted to get out of town. They were so hung up on her boyfriend and her dad. And I know those kinds of people are always suspects, but they were like clutching to the idea that her dad like made a whole ruse that she was kidnapped so he could get the reward yeah. money. And it really, I feel like they didn't have enough ties to make that stick, but it was just like the narrative that they were gunning for. And I'm like, maybe that would be easier but it's not finding this girl, so let it go. The biggest thing that got me was that they didn't request the camera footage from yes. the store. Then they would have known immediately that she was kidnapped, immediately. It's, um, I think this kind of goes back to something that we hear a lot in cases uh, where at-risk communities, and that's, you know, at risk for crime or other socioeconomic things, but really at risk communities, um, these cases are often dismissed because their exposure is so much higher. And I, that's why I think uh, Israel went for an at-risk use. Yeah. Because her case would be so easily overlooked. Like, of course it's her father who has ties to maybe some criminal activity of course it's her boyfriend who she was arguing with you know it's yeah very easy to sweep under the rug what frustrated me was like they didn't even directly go to oh he just went after her or something happened it was like they went this way to get to the father like he created this elaborate ruse and yeah. i'm like well that doesn't make any sense either you like a direct path would have made sense but yeah. like different people had different wilder theories but none of them thought murder by a stranger yeah. even though that's a possibility so it's like if you're yeah. if jumping to wild conclusions jump to one that like is also a possibility murder by stranger and they never yeah. did that's frustrating to me because it could have been a possibility and they just yeah. never never got there crazy it just makes you, you know, if it was like some 40 year old CEO of whatever big Alaskan company and he went missing, they would immediately think 
something bad happened to him, they wouldn't be like, that guy just stripped down. But because she was a young girl, they were just like, whatever. Whatever. You know, why would somebody do that? No. And I get that, like, you don't want to think it could be the worst things, but you're the police, so maybe treat it like that. And then even if it's not the worst thing, you'll get to the conclusion of what happened more quickly. Yeah. I, I don't think, think they were asking the right things. They were so out of their element. There's a there's another kind of passage that it wasn't lost on them that they were investigating like any civilian playing online detective. So these professionals yeah. didn't have a clue how to go about a case where they had no leads and, and these and just taking t- picking at straws really. I mean they had nothing. Um, and they didn't know how to deal with it. Yeah. I agree that it's like they really just wanted to close it out and forget that it was happening and get back to easier police work. So every time like the littlest thing came up, they were like, oh, we know what happened, but you've got to put the pieces together even if there aren't that many pieces. Yeah, I completely agree. That was pretty, it's pretty wild. Um, I just, I, I don't know, and this is where I go back to defending them because, I mean, I think I'm an expert at some things. I don't know yeah. how prepared I would be in a situation like that where I know it's a possibility, but I've never truly done it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I can't agree. Like, if they had that small town mindset, they're going to think that wouldn't happen here, that hasn't happened here in however long. Yeah. The odds that something that bad is happening are so slim. Yeah. I, I don't, I do think that they, they took any weird behavior from the boyfriend and the dad as evidence of their guilt instead of evidence of their distress. Yeah. And that, I mean, I, I get like a lot of these domestic cases are usually boyfriends or family. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's, that's where it's kind of all convoluted is you're going with the most obvious case, but you're mm-hmm. also looking at the less obvious case. And I think that open mindedness would have led them to say, let's request the footage earlier. And they did. Yeah. So uh, it was a definite lack of open mindedness to possibilities that yeah. was understandably their methods but the most frustrating was the lack of like awareness of other things and that that was frustrating yeah yeah i agree if they had been more open-minded earlier on you know i think once somebody's been missing for like three days a week whatever you should like in intensify how you're opening those possibilities but instead yeah. they were just kind of narrowing it onto things that they didn't really have a case for. But like the longer someone's missing, I think you should, you know, go in different directions, split your team up, look for different things. But I could also see how they got the tunnel vision. I'm interested to see what other readers think about that. Or if this is, um, yeah, I do. Cause we, there's so many ways to look at their actions. Yeah. Some like grace and being like, I mean, I wouldn't have done any better. And some with like, I would have done way much like better. I am yeah. curious to see what people thought of that. And if there's any instances where you felt like things could have been handled better, or if maybe mm-hmm. our perspective kind of discolors, we have all the information they didn't at the time. Yeah. How do we as readers have like a sense of empathy for them? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I definitely struggled with that. I was definitely like angry, but at the same time, kind of like, I mean, I get it. So I'm, I'm curious to see how people felt about that. Yeah, maybe some readers will have friends or family in law enforcement who could shed some light on how something like that would actually be handled, what kind of typical steps they would take. That would be really interesting to know. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, our crime fans, tell us what you think. One minute. Another thing I wanted to talk about was when they brought in 
the BAU, the Behavioral Analysis Unit. I'm currently rewatching Criminal Minds. So. Uh, is she's my face. Um, yeah, but like they actually brought them in and requested help because they didn't have any of these leads. And yeah. um, it was like the main FBI agent, like Agent Payne, who was like, "I need some help." And they really seemed like they jumped on it and they were willing to help. But then another agent, Bell, he was like, "Everything I know about the BIU, I learned." from TV, just like you and I might have. And he was like, what are they gonna tell me that I can't surmise for myself? And then I was like, forced to look at like these shows, these books, whatever, in a way that I didn't wanna look at them. Because besides the fact that they're entertaining, you wanna believe that these are people who are like constantly helping and finding great solutions. But then I was really like, how often are they called in to help with this stuff? How accurate are their profiles? How useful are their profiles? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is very interesting because a lot of the things that serial killers do when you start looking at as a whole mm -hmm. are like similar. Um, yeah. This one, it wasn't. You know, he um, later found out that they don't think he had like a type of victim that he went after. It was more opportunity than anything, which mm -hmm. is different. Um, but he was a mid 30s white male. That's like nail on the head. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, I think this profile, even if it is in TV and books, mm -hmm. is right. I mean, yeah. So and that's. Um, I don't know. What do you think? I want to think that they're accurate. And I mean, those kinds of outlets and like that kind of content is how I learned about things like the homicidal triad and yep. what kind of elements happen to a person from birth and childhood that make them into a serial killer, nature versus nurture, and all of that. And I think the actual science of profiling helps make people aware. And so I think that generally it is useful, but I wonder how useful it was in this instance. It bothered me that as like a civilian, if I get semi truthful facts from TV and crime shows and movies, it's like, okay, I'm not a professional. Like I'm not gonna go around diagnosing people. Sometimes yeah. if there's too much criminal minds, I'll get like paranoid in the grocery store. And I'm like, to you is the man. like yeah but I'm not a professional it bothers me that very often in this book the professionals related themselves back to an idea of a profession so like even the ranger who comes out later related himself back to this kind of like icon rather yes. than an actual spent, person yeah a lot of the time was spent like describing his attire and like yes and he was yeah, like, like he was behavior. not the most confident. He really did. He was the most confident. But it bothered me that it was a stereotype. And I felt like. Yeah. Oh, and he wanted to fit into the stereotype. So he was like, I am the Texas Ranger. Ranger. Yeah. Instead of being like, yeah. I know how to do my job and I'm competent and I understand facts and procedure. Yeah. He was just like, I got this cowboy hat. I got this case. Yeah, like I got a cowboy hat. Like my holsters are good. And it but it was ironic because he was the most confident. And he really did. Like if, if it wasn't for him, Israel would never have been caught. Yes. I mean he did he did do that. So like props. But they mentioned several times throughout the book uh Googling stuff and related. Yes to TV or what they found out on crime shows. So it's kind of like, you're supposed to be professionals and you're doing it the same way I would do it, which is yeah. not comforting. It's it not was really disenchanting how much they were like, one, they were literally like, once again, I got on Google and I was yeah. like, I can get on Google probably right. better than you can because I'm a librarian, but okay, Mr. Policeman, you get on that Google and tell me what it you think. Like, it was like a Facebook neighborhood watch. Yes. You ever been on one? And they're like, Bolo, be on the lookout for 
a Jeep Cherokee driving too fast. And I'm like, you're really like someone's dad. Like you need to like, yeah, take a couple notches. Um, this whole thing and everyone's desire to kind of stand out in their own way or be here, or be there. Um, it it seems very amateurish to be professionals. Yeah. And it was pure luck that they ended up getting this guy, which is like terrifying. Yes, and it was also minimally kind of freaky to me that, like, they pulled him over because he went two miles over the speed limit. Right. And I was like, oh, my God, no, I'm going to get pulled over for going two miles over the speed limit. But, like, if he had been super careful, they would have had no reason to pull him over. How much longer would it have been before they had, like, an actual just cause? It, it wasn't Stop. for Raymond, like... I guess we can kind of lead this into the analog because the ranger, Raymond, is that his name? Raymond? Rayland? Rayburn. Rayburn. Um, he was like old school. There was, um, uh-huh. he basically kind of looked for the, for the car as Rio was driving. Uh-huh. The motel, I mean, waited for him to come out. And that was an old school beat. You know, like it was it was super old school. He was like, I'm just cruising around where I think this guy might be, because I know my area. And he found him and he was like, We gotta get this guy on something, wait for him to make one little mistake. Two miles over, pulled him over, and they caught him. And if it wasn't for his which is why like it was so funny that he was like the ranger and yeah. up, without him being the Texas ranger. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's by like a hair. He could have just gotten away with this and kept yes. going. And so it's, I don't know that kind of, I had to put my book down and be like, uh, it's too creepy. Like, it's too creepy. Like, how often does yeah. this happen? How often is it so rare? Or are these guys just smart? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a good way to lead into the analog thing. Um, of course, if you read it, you know that that was, like, his whole thing. And he had those analog kill kits. And I really agree with the author that that was why he got away with it for so long. And, yeah, I think that... Our Texas Ranger kicking it old school was the best bet. And I think it's kind of disheartening that the Anchorage PD, the FBI, they were so reliant on this digital stuff. They were just like, we got to lie and wait and see if he uses the ATM card. But yeah. he was traveling with cash. He was changing the way he was getting about town. You can't rely on digital data to catch you the killer. Like, you have to go catch the killer. And I mean, I'm a child of the digital age. I'm not going to negate how useful that kind of stuff is, but I wonder what kind of analog police work could have helped catch him sooner. Or just a good combination of the two. Mm -hmm. I feel like the person who took the most action in getting out there and looking for him and not eating on him was the one who ended up finding him. Mm-hmm. But it was a combination of technology. Like they use the digital cameras to to get footage and to find out what car he was driving and all that. And then based on those clues, the ranger started looking for him and found him. Yeah. Whereas I felt back in Alaska, they were just waiting for him to make a mistake. And it's yeah. like, that you can't, I think it takes a little bit of both. And in this instance, yeah. There wasn't. It was like one guy hitting the beat and and one person just kind of like waiting. Yeah. If they might have gotten this a lot faster if that combination of efforts had been done quicker. He was yeah. in Alaska for a long time, 30 something days before he yeah. went to Texas. Like he was in your hometown for 30 days and you could not find him. And they yeah. had the house. Oh my God, I forgot that part. They had already been to his house. Yeah. And he had that shed. Yeah. And they didn't even know there was evidence in the truck. And it's like, if you can stop somebody for going two miles over the speed limit, 
you yeah. can find something around their house, even if you can't go in, that is giving you cause to look further. And they didn't even search the right shed when they did. They were like, I, what do you mean there's another shed? And I was like, how do you not? <laughs> oh my God. Like you searched this. It was, um, it wasn't just one case of fumbling. It was like several cases of fumbling. Yes. Uh, that okay. was, it was pure luck. It really was. And that's like terrifying to me. Yeah. I really, they wouldn't even have found Samantha if he hadn't straight up been like, you're looking at the wrong shed. Okay. They go look at the shed. She's not yeah. there. Yeah, that's because I dismembered her and dropped her in a frozen lake. Yeah. Like, why weren't you talking to, like, people around him? Why weren't you talking to his neighbors and his partner? Yeah. Just, and the more I learn about Israel, the more I don't think he was particularly, like, smarter than anybody. Because even in his, like, interview clips he doesn't come off as this like super sophisticated mastermind yeah he's kind of just I mean, honestly like any any low bred criminal would be like don't use your like really yeah. obvious stuff. it's not like super um novel it was like get off the grid that's pretty obvious yeah yeah he was like you know what makes people not follow you using cash, taking out your cell phone battery. Like to him, those things were so obvious. And I agree. I don't think it's because he was like a genius and it's not even because he was like manipulative. Yeah. It was just like, it was kind of like any conspiracy theorist out there who's not even like a bad guy, but maybe it's just kind of like anti-government. They can't track you if you have your own source yeah. of power and like you pay all your bills in cash or you don't have any bills. Like, it's not that hard. So it's like, really, again, why didn't they consider the possibility that somebody would behave that way? I mean, I don't know, like, I feel like this, it's it's a weird thing. And this happens a lot with with uh, serial killers too. You always hear like, well, he seems like a normal guy. Like he seems yeah. normal. Um, he did seem really normal. And like all his little interviews, he was just like, I mean, yeah, I kind of did, I don't, I don't get into it or anything. And I'm like, you yeah. scary. Um, yeah. But his wife just, or his girlfriend, his partner, whatever, just yeah. trust him. Like. Yeah. And he had like some obviously yes. weird behavior. She was like, yeah, you know, he stayed out in his shed until two in the morning. It's whatever. You didn't think, what's he doing out there? You know? I mean. It could have been great. It's two in the morning. I'm nosy, one, okay, nosy. My partner would never be in a shed until two o'clock in the morning without me going, what are you doing? You yeah. Know, well, I'm just like, and I'm like, nosy. you gonna come in and talk to me? I'm nosy. Mm -hmm. Like, my partner can't even play WoW for 30 minutes without me going, <laughs> hello? <laughs> like, I'm here. I'm like, what are you doing in there? You having fun? I'm yeah. Like, um, so I also want to know, any of our viewers here, are you like us, who <laughs> your, your partner's never going to get away with this because you were nosy and involved, or are you just like chill? You're like, I mean, maybe they could. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think they definitely made his spouse out to be like a very independent woman. You know, she had more on her mind than whatever he was yeah. dealing with. But like, they also had his child around. And then again, you know, it's like, as a parent, would you be out in your shed until two in the morning? Or would you be inside, you know, in case she had a nightmare with the bed or whatever? Like, I feel like parents, you know, they're very like light sleepers. They're very attuned to what their kids are doing. But he was so separated. And he was just like, the inside the house, that's like my nice life. The outside the house, that's like my killing life. And I know we hear all about that a lot with serial killers. We do. You do. You hear about it. But again, it's like, if they're talking about things they learned from TV or Google or whatever, why weren't they considering this type of behavior? Or, I don't know, I 
feel like if my if my partner or my son or my friend was or my sister like my family was displaying weird behaviors which both his partner and his mother said that he was and his friends and people who hired him said that he was weird yeah like a red flag to at least ask questions and and be invested and i i wonder how often Serial killers, you hear about all the time, and you really do, that they're just normal and they wouldn't have guessed it. But there was very obvious signs that something was weird. Yeah. Um, and this is one of those times where I hope I would be like, I see you, man. I don't even know if yeah. I would find that person who was like, I had no idea my neighbor was. And I think that adds to the element of fear and yeah. curiosity because you kind of, now that we talk about it so much and now we do have TV shows and books about it and true crime is so like every podcast ever is about true crime. And you would hope that you would recognize it Mm -hmm. to that doubt that you won't. And that's what kind of like draws you into it. Um, I don't know. This is just super, this is just a super cool book and it makes you think a lot about stuff you know and don't know. Yeah, I think overall it was very like hindsight is 2020. How did you not see that? That was so obvious. Why didn't you do this? And I mean, I think that's part of what made it a good book is like I was so invested that I was like living moment to moment. But the people who were actually working this case were really living moment to moment. And, you know, I don't know how long it would really take to put the pieces together, you know, to find out when he was contracted to do whatever they thought it was weird, you know, why he stopped coming home earlier in the day. Yeah. That kind of stuff. You know, I guess you could probably say a lot of people act weird in some ways, but he was acting weird in every way. Yeah. Um, and then it kind of, uh, it kind of leads you to think, how many weirdos you know in your life that you just yeah. put off as like, I mean, that's just, that's just Joe, you know, Joe. And Joe Exotic yeah. is mean by that. <laughs> you know, Joe, he's just the weirdo. Yeah, that's just how he is. But if everybody's saying that's just how he is, don't you wonder why he is that way? I mean, I do because yeah. I'm suspicious minded. Yeah. And even, even Israel Keys knew that like he was weird i think a lot of times when serial killers are portrayed in like movies and tv they're always like this is normal to me i think it's weird that you don't want to kill everybody but he was very like aware he was really self-aware like i'm not going to get into the details i'm not going to tell you about that it's private like he kept saying like private like like it was a weird secret hobby and I guess yeah yeah, exactly he knew it was weird and like he knew it wasn't normal natural behavior and it kind of goes um goes to that topic of serial killers it's they're so terrifying but most of them really do have an understanding that they're perverse like that this is not natural and Mm -hmm. I wonder if that adds to a sense of arrogant okay yeah i know one of our questions that we kind of brought up to each other was um was his behavior taunting when he sent the ransom note Mm -hmm. or was it a plea for help i think he got way too comfortable like 14 years he said he's been doing this yeah and he just got way too like confident and a little arrogant and like maybe he did feel he was smarter than people without maybe yeah. being smarter than people i can i can agree with that i think as somebody who you know as law enforcement as family whatever who wants it to end and be over and figure it out and put this guy away you could think that you know him making these little like rookie mistakes was like a cry for help, like, I can't stop murdering, so you have to stop me. Yeah. 
But I agree. I think it was more taunting. Like when he would overdraw at the ATMs, they were like, if you've been murdering for this long, why would you do that? Like, yeah, he must know that like his lifestyle is not sustainable. But it kind of was. And I think it was more like, you can tell where I've been, but you can't catch me. Yeah. And I'll be somewhere new before you try. And to be honest, they almost didn't. Exactly. Yeah. And so I don't think I really a lot of people were saying that it wasn't sustainable, but as much as you don't want to think it was, it, it was. was. And it was because he was like living that analog way and crossing state lines and stuff. So it was almost, it was almost like he wasn't a genius. Like he's not some criminal yeah. mastermind, but he was doing techniques that we all know work. Yeah. And, it, and eventually you think that like law enforcement would have caught on to say what techniques would a person be using how can we work around them it did work yeah. it worked he got cocky i think it was by mm-hmm. luck that we caught him and then he just gave up he was like well you caught me it was almost very like he knew it was going to happen eventually like he would eventually be caught so when he yeah. did he he didn't fight too hard before just Yeah. And even like his obsession with getting the death penalty date, which I thought was like really interesting throughout the yeah. whole thing, was that he was like, I will give you information if you give me the date that I will die. And he yeah. wasn't even like concerned about living in prison. Like he wasn't afraid of prison life or like facing what he did over time. He was just like, I will legit be too bored in prison to live. So give me a death date. I don't want to do And he gave up. I mean, like, I feel like that's why, spoiler, he committed suicide. Like, yes. he, he'd been caught, and the game was up for him. And he didn't, it was almost like what kept him going was the rush of not being caught. And once the game was up, he had no problem just being like, well, I had a good run. I know where, like, it was very, yeah. it was very almost nonchalant in the way he gave up. And they didn't have to do really good um interrogation techniques yeah yeah i feel yeah. like a lot of times you picture interrogations like we got out with this guy we are gonna plan all his moves but like they for real just went in there and were like let's see what he says because they didn't know anything and he was like we both know that you don't know i'll just tell you but it wasn't like he was like relishing telling them he wasn't like oh my god I can't believe you didn't figure this out he was just like well this is what I did and this is how I did it I guess you wanted to know it was almost not remorseful but more and it wasn't bragging it was just coming like yeah I mean you caught me and that was chilling he wasn't toying with them he wasn't taunting them he was just like well i mean good run gg and then yeah crazy i think yeah it is chilling because you always think that a serial killer a murderer or whatever is gonna be like one extreme or the other like arrogant and braggy or like manipulative and trying to like keep it to themselves but yeah it was really chilling that he was so normal guy about it like they asked him a question and he answered it and that's just all there was to it. Yeah, it was, um, yeah. That's all I'm gonna say on that one. Cause I, there's just, yeah. I wonder what other people would think about that and how, if that met expectations of what they thought would happen when a serial killer got caught, or if it was really dramatically different than what they expected. Mm-hmm. So, you know, sound off in some comments or in our Discord or Goodreads about how you felt about that. Like, did you see that coming? Was that behavior you anticipated or was it new to you? I did not anticipate it. I thought they would be much more like conniving and there just wasn't. Yeah, I agree. Um, Yeah, I agree. And I'm interested to see what people think about that. I think... Maybe the last thing I want to talk about is um, something that came up that made me think about how we talk about trust in Wilder Girls. Yeah. And I'm thinking about it again here. 
um, there were a lot of readers who were like anti-FBI and then there were even a couple like minor characters who were like they're not helpful and yeah. so I think like it brought to mind the trust that we place in the government and the justice system and the institutions that are created to make us feel safe and protected but how safe and protected are we this guy almost got away you know my trust has been rattled a little bit and then you get the insight into how they're working to solve their crimes and they're really just using like google i feel less safe again but then you know they did catch him they did figure out what he was doing and that they were like eight more victims so i'm kind of on the fence like how much trust should we like blind trust should we place in these institutions and how much should you still try and think for yourself quote that's that is a good point because i'm i think i struggle between i know that there's so many cold cases and there are the instances where especially people at at-risk communities get unnoticed and missing mm -hmm. children don't get the attention they deserve i know and i'm not sure i'm up to date on this but i know a while back uh first people and native reservations were hit particularly hard in these instances where people in murder cases just kind of got lost in the red tape yeah i don't know if it's any one person's fault i don't know if there's systematic issues but it does kind of make your trust in those institutions get a little rattled yeah and then I'm kind of like, well, if I don't trust those institutions, what do I do? And yeah, you feel a little lost. Yeah, and it's, um, I don't know if we maintain hope in them because what other options do we have? Mm -hmm. And I do think that there are probably everyone on that case had good intentions. Uh -huh. And outside looking in, you can question how they went about it and their methods. But the intention was to find her and to yeah. figure out and to catch this, catch whoever did it and find out. So I think that I trust the intent of institutions. I don't always trust the methodology. And I think that's where I stand. I think that's a good way to put it. I think in essence, a lot of people might agree with you yeah. that you don't want those institutions to go away you don't want people not looking out for you but you wonder how they're trained to look out for you and if it's the best way for them to do that i think that's where we can grow um and i say that like as we but like okay we're going to talk about the united states because that's where we're in you know um and we do have so many goods and bads about institutions, the FBI, the BAU, local police departments, you know, systematic things as a whole, they have their own issues. You can't look at a front page newspaper and not see that. Yeah. But I also think that for the most part, it's pretty well intended. With criticism and with things where you find these cases and you can look back about what you could have done better, with more of that, I feel like trust can be reestablished and like built to be stronger. Yeah. If these institutions look back and be like, we we should have done better here. We could have done better. Next time yeah. we will we will be better. Yeah. So it's like any organization, you have to learn from the things that you see in retrospect. And if you're not learning from retrospect, then you're probably not doing it right. So maybe perfection isn't obtainable but growth is. So I'm hoping in future cases like this, we see it and we recognize it. And the more we talk about true crime and the more we talk about these things, even if it is morbid, the uh -huh. better we have of like learning and preventing and finding it out maybe before a girl goes missing. Yeah. Yeah. That's my point. Uh -huh. I love your outlook. You always give me a silver lining <laughs> when I just want to like hate on everybody. So yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. There's always room to grow as long as you accept that you need to grow. 
Yeah, and maybe like next time those signs that are super obvious, like he was definitely a serial killer. How did no one notice this? Mm -hmm. Maybe the more we talk about these things, and the more they are in our radar of thought, we can step in before it gets to the point of committed murder. You know, you, you know, you get there. Maybe we can start recognizing the signs of this, like discovering the triad. Like, it's creepy, but we did learn something, and now we can recognize these things and target them better. So in cases That's like this, I really do think that we learn. The more books like this get published, the more TV shows talk about these creepy things, the more likely we are of learning how to recognize it and taking action before it gets really heinous, which is, I don't know, that's a really morbid way of thinking about it. I get that. But it's also kind of like a silver lining. Like, we're learning. We're doing better. Yeah. And that can get established, I think. Yeah. The interest in this kind of topic isn't going to go away. So I think at least you can learn from it. And then it's not as bad of a thing if you think that it's a bad thing. Yeah. I mean, I think even those institutions, you know, they know that they're so talked about now. You got podcasts, you got movies, you've got imaginary TV shows, you've got um, books like this one. It's so, their jobs are stereotyped. Like, literally, yeah. they're running into a stereotype. Um, and I think that kind of retrospective, oh, my God, why didn't we do this? The next case, they will do it. Yeah. And then that next case won't be a book. They would already thought that. So, I don't know. I think... I think that's kind of why we like true crime, is it's talked about. It needs to be talked about. It's weird, but, you know. It's weird, but it's important. It's important. Yeah. And it's a lot of things you don't want to talk about, but you need to know. So, yeah, that's my, that's my thought. I think that's a great place for us to end. I think so, too. Uh, I mean, you know, we gave readers a lot to think about, a lot to talk about. Um, I will make sure to link these like documentary series, their titles, these articles and stuff. I'll put those all in the Discord. Yeah. You know, in a couple of days. And I want to really want to know what people think about it. Or, you know, talk about similar cases. Talk about, you know, true crime that really interests you, even if it's not this. That's why we do this. We want to know what you think. Yeah. I wanted to bring up a few extra things. Discord is a server based chat basically um it's just you can remain a little bit more anonymous and you just sign up for it like you sign up with anything else and you make a little username and you can join our little server and we'll have questions and links there you can check out it's super friendly you can get that link from the goodreads page the goodreads page you can search for groups on goodreads.com parents read the darndest things we have a group mm -hmm. you can the group you can find the discord link Find us on Chattahoochee Valley Library's Facebook page where this video should be posted as well as on our YouTube channel. So yeah. um, I think the comments are turned off the YouTube channels, but the Facebook, but the Facebook. is live open. So uh, sound off. I'm really curious to see what you guys think. And if you haven't read the book, I mean, we told you everything. So. But I still think you should read it. I still think you should read yeah. it. It's quick. It's so quick. And our next book is... Um, it's from the Women Are Some Kind of Magic series by Amanda Lovelace. I don't think it's The Princess Saves Herself in this one, which is the first one. Um, but you don't have to read them all consecutively. Yeah. I think it's the last one. We'll post on our Goodreads, too, so no worries. In any case, it's going to be a really short read. It's just a small book of poetry. And... Um, the one we picked is the one that's in the CDL digital catalog, so that's why we picked it. But if you happen to buy or get the audiobooks or whatever for the other books in the series, all the more good stuff to talk about. Uh, it's really lady positive and gives you a lot of feels, but it's really good stuff. And it's short, it's quick, it's lighter than American Predator. Yay, so lightness. And um, I want to take some recommendations. So if anyone read something super awesome and thinks that we should give it a try in the book club or just for our personal uh, TBRs, 
Uh, let me know because I'm just now finishing the first book of Stormlight Archives and so good. It's so good. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to some new reads. Let me know. Yeah. Okay, so goodbye, friends. From me, Kayla, <laughs> from Adult Services, and um, I'm Lane from. We hope to see you virtually soon. Yes. And keep checking back. Yeah. Thanks for listening, watching. Remember, parents read the darndest things. They do. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, guys. We are springing into summer learning at the Chattahoochee Valley Libraries, and the program you just attended is one of the ways you can earn completions. Just go to cvlga.org and look for Spring into Summer Learning. You can register yourself and your family online, and then start reading and attending our online events. That's all you have to do. We're giving away weekly gift certificates, and every completion you make enters you into a grand prize drawing for tablets, games, gifts, and more. Remember, you have to register to win, cvlga.org, and we'll see you online again real soon.